huge shift is taking place on planet Earth. People seem to be waking up. Tired of the way things used to be, they are creating something brand new and changing the world we live in. My name is Brad Zalas, and I get to sit down with the next generation of idea makers, the disruptors, and the game changers. Everyday people, just like you and me, from all over, who are doing amazing things. Welcome to Awakened Nation. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a good friend of mine on today, Fred Glick. Hey, Freddie, what's up, man? What's going on, Brad? How you been? <laughs> good, man. Uh, in case you don't know, Fred and I grew up together. We were in um, uh, Drumline, junior high, high school, all that. And our band uh, curriculum was very competitive. So um, for what, four, three, four years, you and I marched elbow to elbow uh, yeah. in the Lebanon High School Drumline uh Lipnan in the Haas, you know. <laughs> uh and we grew up in this small town and uh surprisingly a lot of people I think uh, you know the small town values really uh, brought them to this other level. And uh we're going to talk about that today. Uh success in business and you have an unusual uh methodology that you stand on. Uh, and in case you don't know, Fred works in the hospitality industry, and we're just gonna we're gonna dive right in. Are you ready, buddy? I'm ready. Good, good. Um, you're the president. Well, Fred is the president of Emergent Hospitality Group, and he stands on love, service, and care, and how that combination ignites the success of your restaurant. If you don't know who Emergent Hospitality is. Uh, they just bought Pizza Rev, and they have four brands, 30 corporate locations, 13 franchise locations. Uh, what else do you guys own, uh, Fred? We own a Little Big Burger, which is out of Portland. We own BGR out of D.C. metro area in Baltimore, and then American Burger. Nice. Uh, so you like burgers, huh? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of burgers, a lot of pizzas. Yeah. So, uh, Fred, you know, we're good friends and he's here today to really share how he learned to evolve what hospitality really means during the pandemic and what that's, that means today, actually. So welcome to the show, Fred. Good to catch up, man. Yeah. Looking forward to it, Brad. Good. Uh, we grew up on Lebanon bologna and uh, mashed potatoes and corn and stuffing served at the same meal, uh, sauerkraut and pork. Uh, yeah. How did you get into the hospitality industry, brother? Well, I, uh, I went into college with a double major of accounting and music. My dad was an accountant like yours, and my mom uh, was a, a musician. And uh, as you just mentioned, we played drums. So I had no idea what I wanted to do. Got mm -hmm. to college. Uh, I I hated both uh, junior level courses. So I had my first tax accounting, had my first music theory, and just couldn't picture myself doing either. Drop both majors. I had an organizational behavior course my junior year of college. And I really, uh, it's, it was the first course that really hit me as far as the leadership side. Um, in college, we had the same mentality as growing up in Lebanon, which was work hard, play hard. And, yeah. and those values have served me well over the years. I, I always knew that I, I instantly learned when I got to college, I wasn't the smartest guy in the world. I, mm -hmm. I kind of always knew that, but I, I always knew that I could outwork people. So in the business world, uh, the hard work really came into play. And in the hospitality business, which I really enjoyed, I was a bartender for about three or four years and had a blast. Um, the industry is all about people and all about caring and being able to serve other people. So that, that resonated with me. Um, and we're in a people business. And as long as you can uh, take care of your coworkers and the guests, then all the profits will come. Yeah, I agree on that. There, there are certain businesses where you must take care of the customer. And, you know, I've seen you talk about this on other podcasts. Um, some companies are just pure bottom line, you know, pure bottom line, look at the numbers, bean counters. They don't care about corporate culture. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because you know, hospitality industry. And when we say hospitality industry, that's everything from hotels to restaurants to wherever there's food being served or people being taken care of in the hospitality industry. But talk about that because I'm a big fan of take care of your corporate culture, make sure they serve the customer, um, you know, give them the tools to serve the customer at this whole other level. Yeah. So 
Go ahead. I, I, I've worked for uh, a number of brands. One of the, I, I, I read a lot and Ken Blanchard wrote a, a little a summary synopsis of, and he, I first heard about this idea of a triple bottom line. And so the idea is that you want to be the employer of choice. You want to be the destination of choice and you want to be the investment of choice. And it's a leader's job to balance those three. If you don't have a profit, there's no business. You don't have any employees. There's no one to take care of the guest. If you don't have a guest, then you don't have a, you don't have any customers. You don't have any business either. So right. all three have to be um, taken care of. And I, I would, I would add in today's world, in today's environment, you also want to be the neighbor, the neighbor of choice. You want to be a good community citizen. You want to give back to your local communities. And that really engages the younger demographic today and helps on the employee engagement when they get to give back. And we sort of, um, our companies for the, for the last probably 15 years have been very good about engaging the employees around giving back to their local communities and teaching them because I'm not some, you know, in some of the markets we're at, they were never taught to give back. They were just sort of going mm-hmm. through the motions of life. And so we try and t- instill and teach these value systems. So I, I think the way it works is you take care of your employees first and foremost. That's the beginning of the circle. And then you teach them shared values and you hire based around those values. We can teach the skill of how to work in the hospitality industry. We can't teach values. We can't teach them to, to, to serve. And to serve means you're subservient. It means that you're putting yourself below the other person and you're going you're gonna to give of yourself to them, right? So uh, a lot of these values are are, are almost Christian based and, and it didn't, uh, they just work. Right. So yeah. um, we don't teach the Bible. We don't teach religion, but we teach the values that are in there. So love, serve and care uh, all came out of a book called the carpenter by John Gordon. And it's carpenter is obviously someone we all have heard of before. Yeah. It's powerful when people kind of sit back and, and, and we have examples of this as Puritan work ethic, which did come out of this sort of Christian movement of um, show up, drop the ego, serve. Um, I've always been uh, an admirer of the Shakers because we buy their furniture and all this, but there was this idea of hard work. And I, I don't care where you go. I agree with you. I can outwork anybody. And I'm going to outwork in everybody because I don't consider myself that smart in a lot of areas. And, and I compensate by trying to be really smart and write books and stuff. But the reality is, uh, at the end of the day, it is how hard you work. But also, I hear a little, this buzzword nowadays, hustle. And I think, Fred, a lot of people create busy work instead of work that engages and gets you moving forward um, each day. You want to talk a little bit about that? Because people waste a hell of a lot of time hustling. Yeah. I, I uh, Okay. So uh, an example would be, I worked for uh, a brewing company here in San Diego for five years, Carl Strauss. Fantastic company, incredible organization. And it's run by two Stanford MBAs, brilliant people. And they wrote their mission statement like it was for MBAs from Stanford. So it was on the wall. I could see it on the wall. And I said, does anybody know what that means? And I walked around. I went up to all the locations. I said, have you ever seen this? Oh, yeah, I've seen it before. Does, can you explain it to me? Not really. So so we simplified that message because the, the, the message has to be for the, the, the sort of lowest common denominator person that's doing the work right next to the guest. That's where the power of a of a... Uh, mission statement and and core ideology really hits the, the rubber hits the road where the person who is representing the company is meeting the guest not at my level it's it's the hourly cashier that's talking to a, a person or the server the right. bartender so we simplified those values in a way that was easy to understand we basically spelled carl and and you know we cheated a little bit we said carl k is for caring so um but it was easy to 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 rally around get everybody on that simple message uh, I'm reading a book right now from from uh, Brene Brown, Daryl Lee, and she she talks about operationalizing your core ideology, mm. meaning putting it into the everyday. Uh, and, and it's an opportunity I have right now for our company, which is, yeah, we have these values, but how do we make them live every day at the store level with our hourly team members and and get it to to come to life? 
That's really powerful what you just said, because I've seen this in companies like, um, I hate to say it, like Target and Walmart, where they say one thing, the mission is so, wow, I want to get behind that. Um, it wasn't quite as lofty, let's say, as a, you know, a bunch of uh, you know, master's degree guys from Stanford. It was more like, hey, we care, we do this. But the disconnect is they actually do not treat the employees that well. They don't do certain things. You may not know this at Target. Remember when you and I were kids, we'd go to JCPenney and there'd be a salesperson right there helping you pick out that suit. Yeah. Don't laugh, folks. Everybody bought a suit from JCPenney who was <laughs> our age. Uh, and, they w- and they lasted a long time. Uh, but here's the thing. There was a salesperson on the floor dedicated to taking care of you. They don't do that anymore. They now have people who help with sales, but they're really running clothes back and forth. <laughs> That's all they're doing. They're hanging up a band and, you know, they're really, there's a huge disconnect between those corporate videos of happy workers who are actors pretending to be workers and what is actually going on. And you connected that dot. I love the fact that you did that because there seems to be a wall, you know, tell me a, a little bit about this, but there seems to be a wall when you go around and you get a business degree from these colleges and it's being taught by people who have never owned a business. And so there seems to be a huge disconnect between the C-suite, the executives, and the frontline server. And that shouldn't be in my book anyways. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're dead on. And, and you know, uh, I think because I never thought I was the smartest guy, I always continued to learn. And I, I always believed that all of the good answers come from the people dealing with the guest. I'm not going to have all the answers. I'm going to have the experience of doing the wrong thing. Like all experiences is I've already made all the mistakes. It doesn't mean I'm smarter. It just means I tried that and failed and I I tried something else. Um, The other thing we do really well in the hospitality industry is we copy things, right? So we go out, we go, oh my God, this is a great idea. I'm going to bring that back and put it into our own little thing. And we're going to do that here. And so I think we always, if we, if we want to get the answers, then we have to be in the stores talking to the hourly team members to be able to find out how's it going, what's working, what's not working. Have you heard about this? Because you can ask them, you know, you could roll out a wonderful program and it maybe stops at the district manager or the general manager who doesn't think it's a good idea, didn't have any dialogue. And so, you know, you have to create this buy-in at all the, all the different channels. And it, if you can start from the hourly team members and I, who cares who gets the credit, right? So it's, it's a great idea. It was by Sam, the dishwasher, right? He came up with this great idea for a marketing for a new burger. Right. You know, I used to work at Pizza Hut when I was in college. I was a waiter. And sometimes we get one of those late nights on a Thursday where the the restaurant was kind of dead. Uh, And we had a a young man at the time who was our head chef, let's say. He ran the line. This guy, his family was uh, from Sicily. So him working at Pizza Hut, he would, we went against corporate (laughs) structure. He would spice up the sauce a little bit. Uh, once a month, he would shut down the ovens early, crawl inside and clean them till three in the morning. He wanted a pristine oven. But one night he decided to take a pan pizza, put a bunch of stuff in it, ham, cheese, everything, and fold it in half, creating a calzone. And I said, you should run this by the corporate office. Well, Fred, this was 1981 and they never rolled this thing out ever, never thought of it. <laughs> Until I think it was the the late nineties, early two thousand, they came up with the Pizone. Well, Pizone we were making yeah. we were making these things for <laughs> our lunch because we got a free pizza at one point, you know, for for dinner uh, or something to eat. And um, so we would we'd say, "Hey, could you make one of those <laughs> calzones?" And then he would take a fork and put your name in it, uh, and and then bake it, run it through the oven. So. I, I, you're dead on the innovation. Imagine how much more they could have sold if they had listened to the employees on the front line who were creating the product and just having fun, you know, creating something really uh, unique. You know, uh, a lot of restaurants have sort of secret menus and the secret menus really are just what the employees are eating. So if you ever want to have a great meal in a restaurant, ask the server what they eat when they're there and, and they'll come up with some creative ways and they'll say, like, I take this item, but what I do is I put this sauce on it, and then I have the cook do this to it, and because and, they're there every single day. And they'll come up with the best meals for you you've ever had. 
you know, you're so right. I remember when I was getting trained uh, as a waiter and the two guys who were training me, they were like brothers and they ordered a cracker crust pizza with just a little bit of cheese and sauce on it, mushroom and anchovies. I'd never had anchovies in my life. I took one bite of that thing and I went, this is incredible. I mean, I, I learned to love anchovies that day. And you're right. There's a secret menu, man. That is cool. That's yeah. everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Uh, let me ask you this question. I mean, you sit on this thing and some people, they get really upset when you use the word love in the corporate environment, but you're talking about love, service, and care. Let's talk about how that has been the instrument to lift up and expand some of your operations. So we've done this exercise at every company I've ever been. It's one of the first things I like to do, which is go out and do some town halls. And you ask your employees. Uh, you also do a questionnaire to your guests. And you ask them, what is this brand to you? Like, what? why do you come here? What do you love about the brand? And you ask the employees. And then you're sort of wordsmith and you talk, you talk about what's most important. So when we came out with some core ideology when I first got here in 2019. But when COVID hit and and Black Lives Matter hit, and all of this hit at the same time, you know, we sort of got a little softer in our values, right? So the accountability, the maniac pledge might have taken a back seat for the time being, while well, we had to go out and listen to our teams about how, what did this mean to them in their markets? Like, what, what, what do you want the company to, you know, how, how do you want us to act during these times? And right. there was every opinion, just like you listening on the radio, there's every opinion from far left to far right and everything in between. Mm -hmm. And where we, where we came out was we're not a political organization. We, we are, we're here to serve burgers and make people happy and create joy in people through our food and through our interactions and hopefully spark a moment of, you know, let them escape from all of the chaos and all the pain they're going through in their personal lives and come in and just forget about that and have a burger, have a pizza and, and enjoy the experience. So we really, really leaned into that. We over communicated as best we could without traveling too much. And mm -hmm. I, I, and really, I, I mean, I go back to Martin Luther King. He had he had it all figured out. I mean, if, if we would have leaned into that during that instead of the rioting side, because he was never about violence. Right. He was about peaceful protesting and light driving out darkness and being happy and being good to each other. And that's not what happened during this particular one. And obviously what happened to kick it all off was horrific, but it created a lot of dialogue between everybody, gave us the opportunity to sit down and talk to our people and figure it out. But, but really, ultimately, it came down to, you know, our company, our, our team, our company employment base is the Spark team. And we're here to create a spark of happiness and joy and make someone's day, right? So that's, you have one, you have 30 seconds with a guest. That's all you're going to talk to them today. Yeah. And so you have that moment to be yourself and whatever it is that you have as your superpower to, you know, to create that spark. It, well, that's what we try and train. Wow. That's phenomenal. I, I love that. Whenever, whenever I hear that uh, a business leader goes to the front line, uh, doesn't listen to the MBAs and just says, hey, let's go do this. Um, it's astounding what actually comes out. The product becomes better. Um, and the bottom line increases because word gets around word of mouth. It isn't just marketing. It's that experience. And a lot of people, they ask me through the years, Brad, what is a brand? Could you really explain what a brand is? And you just described it, Fred. It is what's my experience in my mind when I go to one of your restaurants. And that's, you, you can't replace that with a postcard that gets in the mail. You can't replace that interaction that people are going to talk about with, with, you know, flashy advertising. You can't do that. It's service to the customer. Yeah. Uh, we all know there are a couple of brands that politically have mucked up and I won't mention them in the past, you know, a couple of years, but one of them I know is doing a phenomenal business and it's because you drive up and they've got five or six people working with each, but you know, car, everything else. And they're taking your order. They're making suggestions and they're sharp. I'm like, it's, it's truly that simple. And I hate to say it. There are a lot of CEOs at the top of these organizations. They're talking the talk, but they're not doing what you do. And that is get in the front line, town hall meeting, ideation sessions. What's top of mind? What pisses you off? 
What bothers you? What could we do better? It's that simple. Yeah. You know, culture exists everywhere. If you, you can you can have a conscious discussion. You can you can have an overt discussion around it because it just is how we do things around here. So if, if you don't uh, dictate what the the you know, if you don't pick and choose it, your employees are going to pick and choose what your what your culture is without you. Yeah. Ain't that the truth? Yeah. yeah. Um, you and I got a huge discipline in drumline mm-hmm. with Donnie Lee. He was our yeah. instructor. Yeah. Uh, Fred and I, you know, we were expected, uh, I'll just let the audience who's not from Lebanon know, because I'm sure people uh, from our hometown are going to listen to this and watch. Um, they treated us like adults back then and expected us to play at the level of a drum and bugle corps. And people don't realize, you know, you watch the movie Drumline. The one thing that just bugged the hell out of me in that movie is they never showed the hours of practice that it took to be able to do the stick moves right, to get the rudiments right, to get all five to seven snare drummers to sound like one. That discipline, I think, has helped you and I in life and also being from a small town. um, Those values really help you in the business world. As my grandfather used to always say to me, he just said, he goes, I believe, Brad, you've been able to get into the boardrooms and work with these companies because of your small town values. And I was kind of like, what does that mean? You, you want to talk about that a little bit? What does it mean to come into these circles with, with small town values? You know, it's funny because we grew up in that town where we didn't know everybody in town, but someone we knew knew, you know, there was, there was like one degree of separation for the entire town. So everybody knew everybody. So everybody kind of watched out for everybody as well. You know, if you're picked up by the police, you probably weren't thrown in jail because they probably knew your dad or whatever. They would, they they would probably just, uh, you know, take you home and say, Hey, put this guy to bed. Um, So I, you know, I, I've lived all over the country. I, I, 21, I moved to Orlando, Florida. I lived there for seven years. I lived in Nebraska for four years, I lived in Seattle, and now I live in Southern California. And the transient towns, uh, you know, the, in the South or, or the big cities where people are moving in, you don't get to know your neighbors. You're not talking, you're not, you're not saying hello to each other in the grocery store. And, and I, I look at even Omaha, which was a town of about 800,000 when I was there, had a small town value. And what I, what I think of that is when there was an Omaha wave, and the Omaha wave was when you're driving. And if you're going anywhere under like 40 miles an hour, you sort of waved to every single person that was driving the other way. Just, just acknowledge their presence. You're, you're, you cared about your fellow man. You know, I moved into Omaha. People came to our back door with tomatoes they grew in their garden or pies they baked for us. They never met us before, but they knew that we were the new neighbor on the street. And that small town is, is what I think of as a community. And it's, it's yeah. people watching out for each other, taking care of each other and helping each other through bad times. You and I remember when the steel plant closed when we were in high school and there was 20, 25% unemployment in our town. And we had neighbors two doors down who had worked at the steel mill all their lives. And, and they were all worried about their, their livelihood and their, how to put their kids through school and, and how, what the next meal was. And, and I, I think that everybody kind of jumped in and helped each, helped each other. And so that's, that's what I think of when I think of the small town community, it's, it's all about people helping each other and caring for each other. It's ironic. You kind of bring that to the, uh, to the restaurant business. You really do helping Absolutely. each other, helping Absolutely. and serving. Yep. Yeah. One of the things I always knew is, um, in a small town, I remember, uh, I, I was dating Heather at the time and we were driving around in my little red, mo- my mom's car and a police officer pulled us over in uh, East Lebanon township, pulled us over and he walks up, you know, license and registration. And I'm sitting there going, Oh, what did they pull us over for? Cause I wasn't speeding. And, uh, he looks at my, uh, my license and he looks at me, he goes, uh, I'll be back in a minute, Mr. Zalas. And I went, as soon as he left, I went, ah, and a, an expletive came out of my mouth. And Heather's like, what? I go, he pronounced my last name correctly, which means he knows my father. I'm about to get in big trouble. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't her dad a judge? Yeah. But I, she goes, yeah, I don't think it's going to be a big deal. Yeah. So here I am with the judge's daughter in a small town worrying about the cops. Uh, and it was nothing. It turned out some. But in West Lebanon Township, 
was doing donuts in a red car that matched the same thing. But like everybody knows everybody, or if they don't, they're one degree of separation from somebody. Yeah. Uh, and I just find that that hysterical. That that also keeps you in line, I think, a little bit too. But um, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna share with our listeners. Um, Fred has been instrumental in some of my success in the speaking industry because when I had one of my first big speaking gigs, um, Fred was I think outside of San Diego at the time. He came in and we ordered a couple of beers and we started talking and all these famous speakers who I had just met that week weekend sat down with us. And you told every crazy story of you and I getting in trouble. <laughs> and it was legendary. I mean, it was just the perfect uh, nightcap for the night because you and I hadn't seen each other in years. Um, and I believe you just started dating Felicia at the time. Yeah. Uh, and you were just, you were filled with all this joy and we just, we caught up, man. It was just such a great time, brother. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, get to know you better. Sure. Um, one of them I wanted to ask you was who has been instrumental or what in your life has been instrumental as far as mentorship or learning or taking it to the next level? Cause I know you're a big fan of self-help stuff as I am. Uh, who could you say that was, or it, maybe there's more than one? Well, uh, it, it started with my parents and, um, you know, for, for different values that they had, but, but I, I take a lot of, of who I am away from, uh, the way I was raised. I was adopted and, um, I had loving, caring parents who instilled what unconditional love was. I think it's the most powerful gift you can give another human being on earth is it's okay. If you fail, I'm still going to love you. Right. So that gave you the opportunity or gave me the opportunity to take risk and to go out and get hurt. And, you know, and I knew I could come home no matter what that gave me the strength at 21 to just say, mom, dad, I love you. I'm going to Florida. Right. I graduated. And I, I was like, there's, I don't want to live in Lebanon. I'm, I'm out. Uh, you right. did a very similar thing. You went to a bigger city. Uh, I went somewhere warm. I was like, I'm going somewhere warm. I've, I've been to Florida. I'm going back. So that was one. And then the next really, uh, I didn't out of college read much, but I remember uh, on vacation one time reading One Minute Manager. And, and it's like, I started to get the bug to get back into leadership and go, you know, I think it's time that I, I was having a blast being a bartender as an hourly employee. I was making lots of cash and I was having lots and lots of fun, but I wasn't a grown up yet, you know, so men yeah. don't grow up till we're like 40 anyway, but I was 20, 24. Sure. And, and I, and I, then I started going to self-help. I, seminars, webinars, all that kind of stuff from Tony Robbins to everybody you can think of. I, I think actually Donald Trump was one of the speakers at one of these things. And I took away some stuff from him as well. Um, so then I read a book called seven habits of highly effective people in, in 1992. And that one really set me up for success. That one was, I just moved to Omaha, Nebraska, just got married, bought my first house, having my first child, opening my first restaurant by myself. And I was totally like, how the hell am I going to do all this? And yeah. that really helped organize my thoughts into a sequential, logical way. So that book, I probably taught to, you know, a couple hundred people of people that were willing to do it. And I wrote my first mission statement at that time, personal mission statement. And I still have it. It sits, it's, it's right above, it sits right above my desk. And I, I get to look at it every day and identify the roles I play. And who I want to be in those roles. So if I'm having a relation, if I'm if if the relationship in front of me is my wife, what what are the specific things I need to do to work on that relationship goals? And then I have sort of overreaching values on there that really come down to being healthy, being happy, being funny, because I think that's one of my superpowers. Is I think I'm hilarious. You are. And the last the last one I added, and I just added the last value um, about a year and a half ago, is gratitude and man, is that a powerful value? If you can wake up and just be thankful for your breathing and your, and all those other things you have, because as you get older, you realize how fragile life is and you watch friends and family and people that you love get sick and some die. And, and you go like, yeah, how much time do we have left on earth? I mean, we, yeah. we should be, we should be enjoying every day. So that is one of the most powerful values that that have really helped shape the way I my outlook on life. That's fantastic. Yeah. Would you like to share your mission statement with our audience? Well, uh, it's pretty long. 
Go um, ahead. Yeah. Well, can you sum it up? Uh, really, my mission is to find vitality, bliss, gratitude, and humor in living. And I will balance as an individual, as a husband and father, as a president of Emergent, as a member of society, and as a chair of Emmanuel Lutheran Church. And then I have different, you know, values under each one of those as far as, you know, uh, love my family unconditionally. Uh, and I and I just added, including new mom and new dad's family. I just met my birth. I just met my birth parents. I heard about this. Yeah, yeah, this is fantastic. Yeah. So each each one of those, I I have to, I'm not a good listener. So I have to try and consciously, you know, not solve problems when people are giving me stuff. I have to try and be empathetic uh, and not be a problem solver when I hear people bring me bring me problems. And and it's it's uh it's an ongoing challenge for me. You and me, man. And um it just so happens a couple of days ago, my girlfriend says to me, she goes, um, I wanted to hear more of the guest. <laughs> you want to hear it? I was like, <laughs> and I go, did you listen to the whole thing? She goes, no, nah, not really. Uh, halfway <laughs> in, I just was like, yeah. And I'm sitting there going, okay, I promise from here on out to listen more. And you're right. It's a, it's hard if you're a problem solver. Yeah. Which, which I'll tell you the other, the other, um, the other important thing I learned how to do in the last ten years, as I met Felicia, was how to really trust someone and be really candid and honest. Um, you know, as a as a man growing up, I realized that I had a lot of crazy thoughts in my head, and I didn't always share all those thoughts. Um, because you don't want to share what the crazy things are because you're putting yourself at risk to be hurt. And that's why this Brene Brown is so powerful because she talks about being vulnerable. You know, it's sort of like the first one to say, I love you. That's pretty vulnerable. If you, if you're the, in a relationship and you say it and you're like, okay, now what are they, you know, you're just putting your heart out there. Like, what do you want to do with this? Right. So, um, you know, in starting over at 48 in a relationship, um, I just became a hundred percent vulnerable to finding, you know, the love of my life by, by putting myself out there and being, putting myself at risk. And when you start from that place, it's much easier to stay there. You know, there's no secrets, there's no history. There's no, we haven't ever hurt each other. So you have this pure place and, and, and I know that you've uh, had similar kind of things in your life of uh, a learning, learning moments and experiences. And, um, you know, I couldn't be happier in having another human being that close to me. It's powerful to have someone to bounce ideas off of. Like you just said, what, you know, she's not even listening to your podcast or she's, she's able to give you candid advice that you're not going to hear from anybody else. Right. Because she knows you and she knows you want that. So that's a powerful tool in your tool belt. It really is. And I think it has to do with uh, wisdom. And my dad always said, just because you get older doesn't mean you get wiser. And I, and I always remember that. He said, you know, do your best to get wiser each year. Yeah. And uh, we're approaching 60 now. And I think, um, you know, it, it took time to figure this out, to figure out the human dynamic. All those soft skills that we were mocked for are now the skills that you must have to be successful, both in a marriage and in business. Absolutely. And, and I just find that ironic. So, so I wanted so to, f- I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm just going to wrap that up because you, you pulled it together very nicely, which is comes down to trust both, it, you know, you got to trust your company to take care of you and your coworkers and your boss and you at home, it, it, tr- you know, that emotion and that, that value, if you can build that um, emotional bank account up to where you can have those honest communications, no matter how difficult they are, because some of them are very, very difficult then you'll have a, a really successful relationship at either work or play. Fantastic. Great way to end this show. Um, <laughs> Freddie, I can't call you Fred or Mr. Glick. It's like we were Freddie for years. I know. <laughs> 11 and high, baby. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you for your insight, your wisdom, your love, your care in this moment, and everything you do with your employees because um, and in your relationships. 
Um, you and I, uh, I guess it was a year or two ago, you were in Vegas and we were hanging out in the pool and just the things you were talking about, man, it's an honor to know you. It's an honor to have grown up with you. And thank you so much for being on the show today. Brad, couldn't be happier and look forward to having another cocktail with you in Denver. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, wear your ski pants. That's all I have to say. I'll, so. I'll be there in the summer. There. Oh, excellent. Come on down. We'll, we'll go hiking. So might be, might be June. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, reach out to Fred. How do we get a hold of you, Fred, if we need to? I know that there's some business people listening who might want to uh, talk about franchising their businesses and things like I, that. I'm on I'm on LinkedIn, Fred Glick, G-L-I-C-K, a merchant hospitality group, or Fred at sparkteamhospitality.com is my email. Excellent. Reach out to Fred, my friends, and uh, thank you for being on our show today. Uh, join us next week. We're going to have another amazing business guest who's going to teach you the deep secrets and take you on another adventure in uh, business building. (laughs) So take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Peace out. Thank you so much for being a big part of the Awakened Nation movement. This is how you can help me and our extraordinary guests. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And let's grow this movement by word of mouth. Our success will be because of you. Thank you and see you next week.